The EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network presents Theology of the Body with your hosts, Father Richard Hogan and Katrina Zeno. Hello, my name is Father Richard Hogan, and this is the Theology of the Body series. I'm a priest of the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis in Minnesota, and with the permission of our Archbishop there, I work full-time with a national apostolate called Natural Family Planning Outreach. My name is Katrina Zeno. I'm co-founder of Women of the Third Millennium, and I have the privilege of traveling and speaking worldwide and nationally on the theology of the body, the dignity of women, marriage, and chastity. Some of you may know that John Paul II, in the first year of his pontificate, specifically on September 5, 1979, started a series of talks which he himself named the theology of the body. These talks continued with a major break during the year of the redemption in 1983, continued from sub September 5th, 79, until November 1984, and comprised 129 different addresses given at the Wednesday audiences in Rome. I think it's exciting, Father Hogan, that we have the opportunity to celebrate the 25th anniversary of that. Yes, this year, right, is the 25th anniversary because it was 79 and this is 2004. We have a picture of John Paul II, although all you can see is his hands holding up the Eucharist here, on the set. I bet you're wondering why I'm holding this orange. I was. Yeah, I thought you were going to eat it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not going to eat it. It's because it helps me understand the theology of the body. You know, when I first tried to read Theology of the Body, I picked it up and I started reading it and I put it down because it was just so very, very difficult. Um, but a couple years later, I picked it back up again and it started making more sense in my life. One of the ways it's helped me understand it is I think of it kind of like an orange. Because if I were to peel this orange, take it apart, it would have different sections. And John Paul II, you know, he's very methodical in his teaching. And so he has six sections. So if I peeled this apart and took it apart as six sections, those are the six sections that we have in Theology of the Body. And the first section is about original man, original humanity, who we were in the Garden of Eden, kind of like perhaps in a setting like this who we were before original sin, and that's where the Pope starts, because he wants to set the foundation of who we were before sin entered the picture. And then the second cycle actually has two parts. The first part is about the human person after original sin, and that would be fallen humanity. And then the second part of that is who we are redeemed in Christ. And that section together, so it would be section number two, is what the Pope calls historical humanity, because it's who we are in time. And then the third section is glorified humanity. I really love that section. The resurrection. That's yeah. the resurrection of the body. <laughs> yeah. The body, because it's the theology of the body. And each of these sections, he's so careful to talk about the meaning and purpose of the body and the fact that in our glorified humanity, at the end of time, we receive a glorified body. So he likes to call that the triptych. You know, another different way, rather than thinking of an orange. The body person in the Garden of Eden, the body person after sin, as we are now, and the body person as we will be in heaven. That's right. right. So that's kind of the first half. And then the second half, which would be the second, the um, fourth, fifth, and sixth, he calls them cycles, are about taking what he's described the human person and applying it. So the first one, he applies who the human person is in the state of virginity. Because, and celibacy. And celibacy, right. right, because the church traditionally talks about two states mm -hmm. because they're the permanent states. Mm -hmm. So virginity or celibacy, which you know very well. And then, um, so that's the fourth cycle. And then the fifth cycle is marriage. Mm -hmm. So he takes the reflections on the human person and the body and redemption and applies them to marriage. And then the very last cycle, why don't you tell us about the, the last, last one? last cycle is the sixth one, and it's the purpose of, the, of all of it. It, uh, he applies what, what he's already concluded based on the analysis of Scripture in the first three cycles and the interest in vocation of marriage and celibacy to the whole area of contraception, especially humani vitae. I really like that section because for me it really speaks about what marital chastity is. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. a phrase that most people don't no, really no, marriage know about. Marriage and chastity are opposite. No, they don't go together, <laughs> do they? Not no. well in the Catholic world, they, they do. They do, but so for no. most yeah. people, you're right. Yeah. You know, they don't think of putting marriage and chastity, chastity. together. And so I really love that section because mm -hmm. marriage is such a fabulous vocation and, and needs to really be renewed. And John Paul II has some very important keys And that's to kind that. of the crowning glory, and it's a new way of looking at this whole teaching of the church. Very important teaching about uh, planning a family and responsible parenthood. 
Now, in order to really talk a little bit more about John Paul II's theology of the body, we, we need to lay some groundwork. And this theology, if you will, is part of a much larger uh, approach that John Paul II is using to explicate and explain in a new way the entire corpus of Catholic teaching. It's not just on the body. And we'll talk about more of that in the second show. But the idea is that this, term, this philosophy, philosophical movement called phenomenology is what John Paul II is using to explain the faith. You know, I don't think many people are familiar with that term. Well, you don't have to be. You don't have to be. That's the good thing about Is it. it. You, don't uh -huh. have you can to be. understand the Pope without even understanding. Without knowing anything about it. Just like you can understand Thomas, St. Thomas Aquinas, the Summa, without really knowing a lot of Aristotle. And you can understand Augustine without knowing a lot of Plato. Well, that's great. Because uh, otherwise good. we'd be yeah. in trouble, wouldn't we'd we? We'd be in real trouble, yeah. John Paul II then is giving us this third way. Uh, Augustine used Plato. Thomas used Aristotle. John Paul II is using phenomenology. Now that's quite a claim. It's an incredible claim. We're saying that John Paul II is another Augustine, another Thomas, another genius of Western civilization. But there are some things that surround his life, at the beginning of his pontificate and his pontificate, that are pretty extraordinary. If you put them all together, they are the signs, I think, the Holy mm. Spirit is painting for us to say this man is important. And the reason he's important is not all of these coincidences, but rather because he is another Augustus, another yeah. Thomas, using phenomenology as the philosophical base to form a new way of speaking about the faith. And the theology of the body is part of that effort. It's one of the cornerstones of it, yeah. but it's part of a much broader effort. Can you tell us some of those? Well, I can try. Can you, yeah. <laughs> you know, John Paul II was elected in October 78 as Pope, and he wasn't expected to be chosen, and neither was the other Pope newly elected in 1978, John Paul I. Yes. Both of them were surprises. And that's pretty unusual in the 20th century mm -hmm. because for most of the elections of the 20th century, everybody knew who would be elected. Uh, with Pius XII in, in 1939, it was between two. With Paul VI in 63, it was the same situation. But John Paul I and John Paul II were really astonishing choices. Whenever a pope is aging, mm -hmm. as John Paul II is now, people start making lists of cardinals that might be pope called papabili lists. And normally in the 20th century, these have been incredibly short. But for the first election in 78, they were incredibly long. And yet when Luciani, the Patriarch of Venice, was chosen, uh, the whole world went, who? Because nobody had any dossier on him. He wasn't one of them that had been named. He was not considered a possibility even. And he's the one who became John Paul, John Paul the I, first. Cardinal Luciani, Patriarch mm -hmm. of Venice. And of course, as we all know, he died within three weeks. In mm -hmm. fact, I was in the seminary and somebody called me up at four in the morning. Now, my brain doesn't work before <laughs> 10 anyway, but they called up and they said, John Paul the first died. I said, what? They said, the Pope died. I said, what? I heard that already. That happened a month ago. You didn't have to wake me up at four in the morning and tell me that Paul VI died. No, they said, Pope John Paul I died. Now, my brain still wasn't functioning. And I said, you mean the one who just got elected, John Paul I? Yes, he died. <laughs> well, what do you want? I could have waited to know this until a little later in the morning. And they said, well, we need some information on some history or something. And I said, I'll call you back. So it was a surprise to the whole world. Mm. So then you have the... Masses for the deceased Pope, nine, I think, in Rome, the Mass of the Holy Spirit, the procession of the cardinals into the conclave, the election. And this time the news anchors had said, we got the waterfront covered, folks. We got dossiers on all the Italian cardinals. We're not going to get caught this time. Plus, we have all of these from around the world that we had before. Right, but the emphasis was Italian, Italian cardinals, cardinals right. right. So then John Paul II is elected, and the dean of the College of Cardinals comes out on the balcony of St. Peter's, and they still do this in Latin. Annuncio vobis gaudium manium. I announce to you a great joy. Mm -hmm. Habemus papam. We have a pope. His name is Votiwa. And there was just dead silence for a split second in the crowd, and then there was this explosion of uh, popular support because they knew this Polish cardinal, now John Paul II, because he had been in Rome a number of times. La nostra lingua italiana, se mi sbaglio. But his, his choice was absolutely beyond belief in terms of 
what was expected. Then we have the double name. You know, there are two questions asked the newly elected Pope before he actually is installed in office or, or takes, if you will, the, the burden of the office. The first question is, will you accept this office? Because they don't have to. Right. And so John Paul I said yes, obviously. And then the second question is, what do you want to be called? And he said in Italian, Giovanni Paolo, John Paul. Well, the cardinal asking the question must have said something like, well, you can't do that. You can have John or you can have Paul, but you can't have both. Right, because it was unprecedented to take two names. Right, it hadn't been changed in a thousand years. Mm -hmm. A thousand years of history this hadn't been changed. And you have to understand how Rome works, how the Vatican works. They never change anything. They still have what a friend of mine calls the papal death tap to determine whether a pope is dead or not. What is they that? They take this hammer, this golden hammer. A real hammer. Yeah, and they, they bong the guy on the forehead and calling out his baptismal name. So with, uh, with Pope Paul VI, I think it was Giovanni, you know, they hit him on the forehead yeah. and say, Giovanni, and they hit him harder and louder, Giovanni, harder and louder a third time, Giovanni, if he doesn't answer, he must be dead. Well, of course, they know he's dead. The doctors have told him he's dead. There's no question that he's dead. And they still do that They today. still do that because that's what was done in the 15th century or the 8th century or whenever. So to take an, a double name mm -hmm. broke this incredible tradition. And when, when John Paul I answered that question, you can't do that because it's a thousand-year tradition. You can have one, but you can't have both. He must have said, oh, yes, I can. I'm Pope. So he did, and we're used to it. But this was such an incredible break with this very, very sort of hardened in cement mm -hmm. sort of tradition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's very unusual for the Vatican. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're going to uh, take a break now. Stay with us on this Theology of the Body discussion. And we're going to continue to talk a little bit about some of these coincidences surrounding the life and pontificate of John Paul II. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. If you would like to write to us at EWTN, we would love to hear from you. Our address is EWTN, 5817 Old Leeds Road, Irondale, Alabama, 35210 or check out our website at www.ewtn.com We now return to Theology of the Body on EWTN Radio. Welcome back to the Theology of the Body series. We were talking before the break about some of the coincidences and significances of Pope John Paul II's life that point to his use of phenomenology as a way of understanding the faith. As a St. Augustine used Plato and Thomas uses Aristotle, John Paul II uses this modern philosophical movement called phenomenology. And the theology of the body is part of this new theological synthesis. We mentioned that John Paul I and John Paul II in 78 were not expected to be chosen. We mentioned the significance of the double name. And of course, 1978 was a very strange year in the church because we had three popes, Paul VI who died in August, John Paul I who died in September, and John Paul II who was the second elected pope or the third pope in a single year. That hasn't happened since 1648, which is pretty unusual. I you know, think that was before my time. Yeah. What about you? No, well, I, as I say, I was awakened in the seminary, so I was <laughs> old enough to be in school. And, of course, then you have the fact that John Paul II is from Poland, 
You know, if you had said to somebody in 1974 or 5, the next pope is going to be a Polish cardinal, they would have looked at you kind of strange. The last time there was a non-Italian pope, you know when that was? Katrina? No, I don't have any idea. 1523, he was a Dutchman. You know, Rome is in Italy, and they speak Italian there mostly. And normally you would expect that it'd be a, they'd have an Italian bishop, right? And the pope is the bishop of Rome, so normally it's an Italian. This is not unusual in the United States, say Chicago, if we had a Polish bishop who was born in Poland. That would be a little unusual, even though there are a lot of Polish Catholics in Chicago. Still, it would be unusual. So it's not unlikely that a, an Italian town would have a, an Italian bishop. But in this case, in 1978, we have a Polish pope, a Polish bishop of Rome. That hasn't happened for 400 and some years. These are very unusual circumstances, all of them. Also, obviously, John Paul II comes from a communist country. You might have seen the movie, The Shoes of the Fisherman. No, That's I've never seen dated. it. dated. Yeah, this might be before your time, too. <laughs> but Why the, don't you um, tell us some more about the significances of John Paul II? I'm fascinated that there's so many of them. Oh, there's just, yeah, there's 12 or 13 that I've just picked out. There are wow. probably more. But the, uh, the Shoes of the Fisherman was a movie about the church that elected a, pol a communist pope, a pope from a communist country. I really shouldn't say a communist pope. He wasn't, even in the movie. But he was elected from the Soviet Union. And that ended with uh, the pope in the movie trying to make peace between the Chinese, the Americans, and the Russians over some food problem. Yeah. And the way he was going to do it was sell the Vatican Museum. Now, who would buy it or how much you could charge for one of those pieces? I mean, what is the Sistine Chapel worth or Michelangelo's Pietà? But that was the deus ex machina of the movie. But that's hardly the way John Paul II treats the communists because he was obviously victorious with the communists. Mm -hmm. uh, on his first trip to Poland as pope, he wanted to be there on the Polish national feast day, which was uh, the patronal saint of mm -hmm. Poland. And they wouldn't let him come. Right. It was like the 4th of July or something. Right. Who so wouldn't let him come? It was the, the regime, the mm -hmm. communist regime. In Poland? In Poland. Mm -hmm. So he had all the concordats and treaties and everything else necessary signed. And then by his order, the Vicar of Christ, the Pope of Rome, the universal head of the church, that feast was moved one week later while he was there. So that year, that feast day was celebrated <laughs> when, a week later. A week later, because he wanted to be there for the feast. Now, it didn't change all of the celebrations. You can't change yeah. the 4th of July or a National Independence Day feast and all the secular celebrations, but he changed the liturgical celebration. Mm -hmm. He beats them at their own game, and of course, this is another one of his successes the fall of the communist regimes in Eastern Europe. Everybody knows that it was the military buildup in the United States combined with, and of course, an essential part of, was the uh, papal um, third or fifth column mm -hmm. behind the scenes, especially his theology, his philosophy, his preaching on the dignity of the human person. I mean, who would have believed in the 60s or early 70s that the communist government, the Iron Curtain, would fall? Would fall. I think it's kind of like, I think for some people the day that Kennedy was shot. Right, you know, remembering right, yeah. I can remember where I was. I was in a small island in Upper Peninsula of Michigan uh -huh. the day we heard that communism was falling apart. It was falling apart. And, and it was just, you were incredulous because it seemed like this was something that always would be. It would be just absolutely permanent in our world. Yes. Yeah. It is incredible what has, what has transpired. And it's because of the work of John Paul II. Mm. Now something that big you can't attribute to one, one single cause. But certainly, John mm -hmm. Paul II was as important as any kind of economic or military pressure mm -hmm. brought to bear. Uh, the, it turns out the Pope does have legions, and Stalin was wrong. <laughs> but the legions mm -hmm. are ideas. Have you had a chance to meet the Pope personally, Father? Hope? Yes, yes, I did a couple times. Right. I had the privilege to meet him when my son was almost five. We were in Rome that week of his birthday. And I brought a picture with me so we could um, show the audience. But we wrote and we asked if for my son's fifth birthday we could come and meet the Pope. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, they gave us permission. And I'll never forget that day because it was such a precious experience to be with my son in his innocence and to meet John Paul II and to be blessed by him. And I really experienced that day blessings in my life uh, for motherhood mm -hmm. and for spiritual motherhood, I discovered. But to meet him in person, everything that he speaks about, the dignity of the human person, his attentiveness, to actually see it 
incarnated yeah, in him. He lives him. it. He, lives he really it. does yeah. live it. And so, yeah. when you're talking about the fall of communism, this isn't an academic exercise, no, 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 is no, it? No, 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 not at all. It's really no, no. about his person Personal. and how he right. relates right. to right. other people. There is, of course, the terrible assassination attempt. Mm. You know, and uh, Pope has not been attacked by. Uh, forces of a government, and that was pretty clear as Bul Bulgaria behind that attempt, uh, since 1302 when some thugs of the French king uh, beat up the Pope. This is incredible. Then you have his travels, he, he globetrots the world, <laughs> and you know, people in, in Rome say, well, he ought to stay home and sign all these papers we send him, you know, the bureaucracy at the Vatican. But a Pope uh, never has traveled like this, mm. from the um, Risorgimento in Italy in 1871, until 1929, the Pope never left Rome, mm. and then Pius the Eleventh uh, and Pius the Twelfth almost never left Rome. Mm. Paul the Sixth went to three places. He went to the Holy Land, went to Constantinople, and came to the UN in New York. But these weren't pastoral visits, giving you know 12, 13 talks a day, saying masses for a million and a half in public squares and parks. This is just popes don't do this. So for someone who's been raised under John Paul II's pontificate. I think that's the impression that this is what a pope does, and what you're saying is this was this innovative. This is very unusual, very wow. unusual. And also his beginning of World Youth Day. Right. You know, at a time when people were kind of writing off the youth, what did he do but say, "I want to go to them and collect exactly. them together"? Exactly. And all over the world, right? How they've responded. It's, yes. It's and then of course it, when you look at his um, his work in the church prior to the to his election, it is also. Astonishing. I mean, if you actually planned out a career as a priest, you know, you're going to be um, ordained by the Polish cardinal in in Krakow in 1946. He's going to send you off to do a degree at the Angelicum in Rome, a theology degree. Then you're going to come back to a year in a parish, and then you're going to go and get a, a PhD in philosophy at the University of Krakow. Then, at the age of 58, you're going to be na na named auxiliary bishop in Krakow, and then cardinal archbishop of Krakow. Then you're going to go to the Vatican Council and influence, in a major way, two of the major documents, uh, How did the he two do constitutions that? of the Church. Mm -hmm. Well, he wrote one of them. Which one? Uh, the Gaudium et Spes, or the Pastoral Constitution on the Church in the Modern World. So did he actually sit down and write it, or a, was it a group of people who he wrote He and it? a team of scholars that, that were around him in, in Krakow mm -hmm. wrote it and brought it to the Council. Now, it was not taken wholesale. It was edited okay. and changed a bit, but substantially, the work is his, mm. and he wrote similarly very large sections of the other constitution on the church, the dogmatic constitution. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so odd when people quote the Vatican Council against him, because he wrote uh, right. <laughs> really large sections of it. He influenced Pope Paul VI in the famous birth control encyclical, Humani Vitae, because it was basically his ideas, his thought, mm -hmm. particularly expressed in Love and Responsibility, that he published in 63, and a talk he gave in Milan, Italy, just before Humanae Vitae was issued. Mm -hmm. It's fair to say that influencing the Second Vatican Council and Humanae Vitae, these are incredibly important events in the church. It's fair to say that there has not been a, a reaction to an encyclical mm -hmm. since the Reformation, like against Humanae Vitae. Mm -hmm. So this man has had this in incredible impact. Mm -hmm. And if you were plan out in, planning out a career in, in the 40s in Poland that you'd have in the church, they'd lock you up and throw away the key if you said something like this. And yet it, it shows that there, there's something about mm. this pontificate. None of these things are really important in themselves. They're important because it shows how important he is. And he's important because of this new synthesis, this new way of thinking about the faith, this application of this philosophical movement called phenomenology to the faith. Doesn't it also show, though, how the Holy Spirit is constantly moving? I mean, I think Oh, this some... pontificate is, but it's really, in some, we know the Holy Spirit by faith is always moving right. in the church, especially through the sacraments and the grace right. life and prayer. But the guiding of history is sometimes a very light hand and sometimes a heavier hand. We need it now, and mm -hmm. it's more palpable. Mm -hmm. And these signs, I think, are almost like a, the points on an arrow mm -hmm. that uh, is lit up for us by the Holy Spirit, and the arrow is pointing right at the head mm -hmm. of Pope John Paul II. I wanted to talk about, just name a couple of other things, the New Catechism. People quote that all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm sure many of the viewers at EWTN read it regularly. But that's only the second time in history 
that the church has issued a catechism. And when was the other one? The other one was after Trent, called the Roman Catechism in the 1600s. So hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. And, this and is, John Paul felt that we just needed a collection uh, or recollection of the church's teaching and its doctrine presented in a new way. Or actually, the bishops asked for mm -hmm. it at one, of their, at one of their synods in Rome. So mm -hmm. whether the idea was rattling around in John Paul II's mm -hmm. mind or whether it mm -hmm. came from the bishops, in any case, it came under his watch, as right. they say. And, you know, you think that after all of this and um, close to 25 years in the papacy, that he kind of rests on his laurels. After all, he's over 80 now. That he would say, well, I've kind of done my part. Mm -hmm. so, so what does he do to celebrate his 25th anniversary? I don't remember. He issues an encyclical on the rosary. And he says, I think we should have five more mysteries, so let's have another 50 Hail Marys added to the rosary. Katrina, do you know the last time the rosary was changed? I didn't even know the rosary could be changed. No. I think it shocked me <laughs> yeah. and lots of other people. It's never changed. No pope in history has dared touch this mm -hmm. for almost eight, nine hundred years if the legend about Dominic uh, giving, mm -hmm. receiving the rosary from the Blessed Mother is true. And yet John Paul II right. did it. And what, what, what makes him what inspires him to do things like that? Instead of just, you know, same old, same old, he's such a pope that is always willing to go where no man or no pope no, has gone, gone before. before. It's the Holy Spirit. So we're going to talk more about John Paul II's new way of talking about the faith, in particular, his theology of the body, next time. You've been listening to Theology of the Body with Father Richard Hogan and Katrina Zeno on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network.